morning and welcome to church. My name is Lauren and I'm here to tell you all about what's happening this week at River City. If you're new here, welcome. We're so glad you chose to worship with us today. If you'd like, you can go on our website and fill out a digital connection card or you can meet us at the Info Hub following service and fill one out there. Men's Weekend is happening next Saturday, October 21st. There will be food, fun, and a guest speaker. If you'd like, you can go on our website and get your tickets, and you will also be entered into a drawing to win an AR-15. Hey guys, we just want to encourage y'all to come join us at Current Youth on Wednesday nights from 7 to 8.30 p.m. We hope to see y'all there. Women's Weekend is October 7th for ages 16 and up. Be sure to register online. Baby dedications are happening on October 22nd. If you'd like, you can go on our website and go to the home page and you'll see the baby dedication link to sign up your child. You can stay connected with us by following us on all of our social media or visiting our website. We know that you could have been anywhere today and you chose to be here with us. Now, if we can all stand to our feet and give God a hand clap of praise. God is good. And I'm here to tell you this morning, hey, all the time, y'all are starting to catch on, man. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Before it's over, we'll start having some praise breaks and people shaking all over the place. Anyways, you know, all that's uh, kind of mentioned a little bit this morning, we need to pray for what's going on in Israel right now. And we need to pray for those things. And, and, and it is, it's a lot of people are calling, oh, this is it, this is it, this is it. And I said, you know what? I, I want to preach to the church today about what I feel like God laid on my heart. and I feel like it, it addresses a lot of the things in the world. And if you don't know what's going on in Israel today, just say the name of Israel and maybe don't look it up because <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild. I was there last year around this time of year, a little bit after this time of year, early late October, early November. And some of the areas where this is all happening right now, um, we were in and it's just crazy to see some of the things happening and you recognize some of the landscape and you see it and you just go, my God, man, like it could have happened when I was there. You know, you, you, never, you never know when these things are going to break loose in some of these countries. I'm going to tell you something. In America, we are so blessed. We are so blessed. Like the worst thing that we're worried about is that the local store ran out of my favorite cream soda, Dr. Pepper. You know, and, and, I, and I don't mean to poke fun at it, but it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of ridiculously funny, right? Like, we, we get bent out of shape, man, over stuff. Like, it, it is just ridiculous what we get bent out of shape over when there's some real issues taking place in the world. And some of those real issues are a country that we've supported, we've been involved with for years, and that's Myanmar. Uh, and I, I just want to bring up this morning, uh, I don't know if anyone knows about it, I don't, it's not on social media, but Elvis Bly. Uh, was has put been put in ICU Friday, um, and uh, they they in, I think they what do you call it intubated him this morning. Uh, he's not doing very well. Uh, he's having trouble getting oxygen, and he has a lot of organ failure right now. And uh, he's one of my best friends. And right now, I just want to pause for a second in the name of Jesus, and I just want to speak over Elvis Boy. If you'll point toward DFW right now, I'm going to see him after, but I want to go after we've already prayed for him this morning in the name of Jesus. I plead your blood right now over Elvis Boy, God, and the hospital right there in Euless and Hurst right now. God, I just speak, God, let your spirit move on his body right now. God, I speak right now to those organs. Or those organs live in the name of Jesus. Come on, speak that with me. Live. In the name of Jesus, we speak it, God, and we believe it. God, I don't believe you're finished with him. In the name of Jesus, we stand on it. And this morning when we get done, in just a minute, if you will, I, I, I want us to, some of you leaders, we're going to gather around and we're going to pray over a, a prayer cloth because I'm going to go up this afternoon. I think Dad and I both are going to go up and we're going to sit with him for a little while and just pray for him. And, and I, I, we ought to just send prayer through that. I, I believe, still believe in the anointing. Come on, y'all still believe in the anointing? I still believe in it. 
He's been a very good friend to me. Uh, he started being my dad's friend, kind of, I guess, and I stole him. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I love Elvis, boy. We have a lot in common, and we pick at each other a lot. We get on each other a lot. And I, I tell you what, I need, I, it's, you know, sometimes you realize you just, I, need, I, need some, I need that guy. And, um, and please keep him in your prayers this morning. This morning, you can be seated all over the room. I'm not going to start out with a big, a big scripture reading, so... I was getting ready for this today, and this is Field Manual to Life Stuff, Part 3. The first week, we looked at spiritual warfare, leaned in on that. The last week, we looked in at stress. How many people have felt some stress after that message was preached last week? Yeah, some of you, some of you are being honest, and I see a little hand go up, a little flicker go up. You felt some See, these are things that we've been taught not to talk about. Um, in, my, in my experience, in my family, a lot of times we just kind of have a suck it up and push through it attitude. Anybody, ever, anybody else, y'all raised in a family, there you go, suck it up, buttercup, right? If you, you don't like it now, you're not going to like it in a minute, right? That's kind of how, how we've always said it, but I realize that, that, that we're, we're not speaking to these things that well, and, and there's a book that was written by Chris Hodges, and he's somebody I read a lot of his stuff. He, he has some phenom, phenomenal material out there. But Chris Hodges wrote a book called Out of the Cave. And really, it addresses stress, depression, and anxiety. And he tells his story in that book, and I highly recommend it. Out of the Cave, you can buy it at Mardell. And, and read that book. If you're going through some things, stress, whether it's stress, depression, anxiety, uh, it's, it's a great book and it's a great resource. Um, if I were to ask, um, show of hands, who would be honest in this room, you know what real anxiety feels like, just real quick, come on, there's men in the room, you know what I'm talking about, there you go, there's, there's some honest men, there's a lot of men, I'm proud of you guys, because a lot of times we like to say, I'm, I'm too tough for that, right, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a man from Texas, that gummit. I don't need, I don't, I don't need to complain about stuff, I can suck it up, keep moving, but we just keep, we keep staying in these places and we just keep revisiting the same things over and over and over and hey media team if y'all don't start that clock I'm gonna go for an hour and a half today I'm just gonna get get y'all get y'all heads up back there so (laughs) so I I don't want to do that to the room but but something that I've dealt with with some things in my life and I'm going to talk about that for just a second and in like really I look back now and I realize I was having panic attacks and, and I didn't know what those were until my wife has started going through training and for marriage and family counseling. She'll, she'll be done soon. I'm so excited about that. Finish her master's degree up in that. She's the smart one. Amen. I'm excited. She's awesome. She's not here in the room this morning, but she's in the building. So she is uh, helping in Sunday school fill in. We had a sick teacher this morning, so she said, well, I'll cover it. That's, she's awesome like that. Hey, how many of you guys enjoyed Women's Day, Women's Weekend this past? That was pretty awesome, huh? She's awesome, man. If you, you want to talk about anxiety, Friday night was interesting. And, and I told her, you're going to kill it like you always do. Like, she doesn't, she doesn't want to speak often, but when she does, she's got something to say. And it's always good. And, and so, um, you know, I've learned a little bit from her as she's been studying and learning more. And I realized, like, wow, I, like, I, that's, that's me. Like, I've, I've been there before. And, and see, a lot of us, we think that anxiety is a malfunction of the mind. But it's really, it's really not. Like we think I need to go get a, on a drug to fix it. And there are cases where we need to get maybe on a drug to fix something. But the truth of the matter is, most of it is, is stuff we're bringing in our own life. It's just the truth. Like it's, it's the way we talk to ourselves. It's the way we treat ourselves. This morning, I told myself you're a moron. And then I said, hey, quit talking to you like that. Right? Messing with my little buddy like that, my little brain. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, it, the way you talk to yourself is, is important. And I, I have some of the worst negative talk in the world. I am a board certified pessimist. I really am. Like, I should have an award on the wall. Like, if something's doing great in the back of my mind, I'm going, what's going to happen next? Like, it's going to all fall apart, right? And a lot of us, like, we, we do that, and I've had to learn to quit. I start telling myself, myself we, well, we want to say shut up Satan sometimes, but sometimes I need to say, hey, you, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Talk good to yourself, right? Why? Because you, you got to get out of this. 
You got to get out of this, and I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. You're just ruminating, like you're just, just constantly just running yourself down, putting yourself deeper and deeper in this hole. And a lot of times we think anxiety, like it's, I got to go get on a drug for it. I got a chemical imbalance. Johan Hari said this, he said, we need to talk less about chemical imbalances and more about the imbalances in the way we live our lives. Yeah. I don't know if I said it in church last week, but I know I said it in in one of my classes this week. I I saw an interesting, uh, I follow a lot of history stuff. I love history. I geek out over history. Like people start talking history and I'm like, oh, that's amazing. And so I was reading this week and it was interesting. Uh, One historian claims, and I don't know how true it is, but um, sounds good for the message, right? (laughs) No, he, he claims that and, and, and argues that when you look back at medieval times and there were landlords and peasants and some of the reason that our forefathers of this country decided to secede, uh, they, 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 were, they were living in times where the church had a lot of sway in the areas, in, 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 the, in the countries. And I think it's interesting, he, he said, you know, that if you do the homework and we've studied, we've looked at holidays that were Catholic or Anglican holidays and sometimes Protestant holidays also, they believed that the people needed more time off in order to focus on what matters and they argued that's God, right? People need to focus on God. Now, this is, this is interesting when I heard this. He said that the average peasant only worked about 150 days a year. Now, you do the homework on that, that's, that's almost as low as one-third of the year was actually spent working. They lived at a slower pace of life, sure. It was physical labor, but anybody in this room knows that if you, if you do physical labor a lot of times, uh, how many men in here like work a job where you, you use your hands and you're up on your feet and you move a little bit? Awesome, awesome. I, I, I'm noticing something. Most of these men in the room <clears throat> are not overweight, <laughs> It's true, like you start paying attention, these guys are in a little better physical shape. Uh, And and most of them, you start talking to them about stress, and they're like, you just need to go work one hard day, and like you'll get over it, right? And maybe that's why my family was all that way, because they they, they worked physical labor jobs, and they stayed in shape, and they they kept a smile on their face. Any time there was a bad day, they'd just go to work and just focus in and just work like crazy. And it's amazing how you can get over nerves and everything else when you wear yourself out. And so now we pay people to let us go and work, and we call these places gyms. <laughs> Literally, it's called working out, right? I, I don't do a physical labor job, so I have a little workplace in my garage. At one whole side of my garage is my power racks. Is I got my barbells, I got my, all my weight, I've invested over the years in these things, and I have a full setup to get after it, and I go out there sometimes if I'm having a bad day, and I just push on some heavy stuff, amen? Why? Because I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get myself in the right frame of mind. And so these peasants, they, they worked about 150 days a year. You do the homework on your work year. If you have two weeks off, paid vacation. Some of you have two weeks off, but it ain't paid vacation. That happens a lot of times. Uh, I, I was figuring it the other day, it's five days a week. That's about 250 days a year. We work about 100 more days than a peasant would have. And we, and, and we say, yeah, but we're free, and they weren't free. We're addicted to things up to our eyeballs. We've accumulated a bunch of junk. We have cars we really can't afford. We have houses we can no longer, which that's inflation and everything else. I was doing the homework the other day. Dad mentioned in a message how much, he, how well God had blessed him in the 1980s. And I said, Dad, do you realize that's the purchasing power today of about $400,000 a year? Like I, I, I saw a post the other day, and I want to say to boomers in the room, baby boomers in the room and some Gen X, like you guys lived in one of the, one of the greatest economic times in American history. Like, we're telling people, hey, roll your sleeves up and do hard work, and it'll all work out for you. I don't mean to complain about government and all those things, but it's kind of on us over time, like, because we've become consumers and we're not producers anymore. I'm preaching to somebody right now in Jesus' name. Somebody needs to go hang the credit card up, and all that anxiety and stress would probably go away, amen? (laughs) 
Oh yeah, there's some husbands and well and wives, probably more wives sitting there looking at him going, You got enough guns? Do you need a third side by side ATV? All right. Like I don't I don't think you really need it. And we accumulate all this stuff and then we have a hard time keeping up with it. And we have to bust it just to keep up with these things. And it creates all these issues in our lives. So again, it's not chemical imbalances, it's life imbalances. Chris Hodges really gets into this in his book and come uh, uh, out of the cave. And he, man, he's a sharp guy. He's a guy who has a lot of anxiety in his life. And it, he really digs into these things. And so today I'm going to hit about five points that really get into this. And I, I want to say this to you this morning. Anxiety is not a malfunction of the mind. It's a signal. It's a signal. Anxiety is a little different than stress. A lot of us, we, we, we put anxiety with stress. And I'm splitting these up because he did in his book. And I think phenomenal uh, concept. Stress is brought on by external things that I cannot control, but I can control my response. I can control my response. Sometimes you just have to bear with stress and live through it, and you'll pop out the other end of it, and everything will be okay. Amen? Anybody ever been there before? Yeah, that's right. I, I know. He said, well, well but, but I can just go to Jesus and everything goes away. Look, look, go tell all those people being persecuted in biblical times and even today that that's, we've gotten rid of the idea of struggle. There is going to be struggle and toil in this life. Y'all, I said it right. I didn't say toil. I said toil. <laughs> My wife's wearing off on me. All that proper talk and such. So what is anxiety? Like, where's the difference? Anxiety can be deep within you and brought on by internal things. It's emotions and things of the like, even when everything in the external is perfect. It's the truth. I mean, I can tell you right now, I've been in times where everything should be great. I, I should be the happiest I have ever been. But I'm not. Anybody... Come on, show of hands in the room. You've been there. I should be excited right now, but I feel nothing. Someone, I, I'm just going to be honest with you right now, and I hope you're okay with transparency. If you don't like transparency, you're not going to like this church. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I've just kind of, we're, we're in a lot of changes as a church. My dad and I are in a transition time right now, and, and we, we've seen a lot go on, and we've grown a lot, and our, our core has grown. Man, this past Wednesday night was phenomenal. We had Rachel Atkinson come in. Come on, y'all have a good time? Worship team wrecked. And you want to talk anxiety, like our, our front lead, lead female vocal is Heather, and she's phenomenal. And she wakes up sick Wednesday morning, and we get the news, and I'm just like, oh my God, what are we going to do? People, people can't be my source of joy. Like, you can't, you can't let people, and it's unfair to them when you make them something that they're not supposed to be. Now, that's not at her at all. I, I, I'm just trying to say, sometimes we'll let something go on that has nothing to do with me, affect me, because anxiety, we start all that self-talk, and we start all that, oh, God, it's not going to work out, I guess. Oh, good God. And we, we just get sideways. Like, we, we talk ourselves into depression if we're not careful. I, I'm, I'm the world's worst about it sometimes. But see, you don't have to let your internal issues control you either. Your feelings, right? Your emotions. We live in a world of follow your heart. <laughs> uh -uh. Who can know the heart? The Bible said, how do you, it's, it's increasingly wicked. Like, like, hey dude, who can control the thing? Like, you, you don't know. It, it just, it'll, it'll carry you all over the place. You don't have to live with that though. You can change some things in your life. This morning, I, I'm, uh, anybody here, you're a, um, like, ADHD people, anybody in the room, proud ADHD. Look, at that's my people right there. That's my people right there. We'll talk about a hundred different things in a little while, all right? Right now, I've got to stay focused, though. <laughs> so, so, it's so bad, guys, that I barely talk to any. I come to church on Sunday mornings. I wait. I get here. I, I communicate with everybody on my phone. If you're new here, I've talked about this before, but I communicate with our teams on our phone, and we're good to go. And I don't show up till right about the time they're starting because if you come talk to me before church, I'm like, please, please, if you bring up any other subject, I'm going to be up there preaching about it in a minute, and it's not going to, it wasn't in my notes, and that's what happens, and I can't do this. 
And so I had to, like, had to protect the brain, right? Like, I got to get it there. We'll talk later. But uh, this morning, I, I kind of had an ADHD moment where I was <laughs> finishing up my notes, getting ready to send it to the media team. And um, anybody who's ADHD, you know, you know how this goes. Um, very important focus moment, and I clicked Facebook. I didn't even think about it. Like, I didn't even try. I didn't intentionally do it. My, my fingers just went, oh, Facebook, uh, distraction, yes. And, like, the first, the first thing I saw this morning, I thought it was pretty good, actually. A guy posted it. He said, today we can affirm that we live in a world where a phone vibrates louder than our heart. We live in a world where food is filled with chemicals while soap contains cereal, honey, and vitamins. That don't make no sense. It's true, though. We, this, is, this, this really hurt my feelings, all right? We, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. We live in a world where TVs are thinner and we are thicker. We, we've made everything else smaller so that we can fit better. <laughs> Okay, anyways, we live in a world where phones are smarter than their owners. <laughs> here, here. Amen. Um, we live in a world where the way you dress is more valued than how you think. Mm. We live in a world where pizza arrives faster than the police. Fatu, I'm sorry. I should have proofread that first. <laughs> I apologize. Where, are you? where is he? I don't know where he's at. There he is. I apologize, man. That wasn't very nice. Or an Uber arrives before an ambulance. Ooh. Melissa, I do apologize. I, I'm sorry. We live in a world where animals are better friends than people. Hmm. We live in a world where we don't try to solve problems, but we just learn to live with them. Whoa, this one got me. We live in a world where funeral matters more than the, the deceased, and celebrating a wedding is more important than the marriage itself. We live in a world where social networks are full of happy pictures and sad people. Ooh. Oof, this one hit me. We live in a world where a footballer is more demanded than a good politician. We focus more on that. We live in a world where things are valued more than people. And we, un we wonder why we are so unhappy and we are so joyless because we build our lives with stuff. Life stuff. That really have no value in the eyes of God, really. Like, I have preached so many sermons. I, like, I love sports. Anybody in the room? I'm not knocking sports. Y'all love I love the sport. Cowboys, yes, boy, them cowboys are doing good. I'm being a little bit cautious about saying that. A little cautious about it. My high school football team, I, I announce games this Friday night, I'll announce another one. They're up right now 5-0 and o on the season, and I am pumped. About, I'm so proud of them. They're getting it done, man. I, I keep up with this stuff. I, I really do, but the truth of the matter is, I've preached so many message about sport, messages about sports, and I've, I think recently I preached one and talked about it a lot, and I, and I love sports. I, I really do. Guys, guess what? It's entertainment. We literally pay a bunch of athletes who many times think that, like, what I do is very important. You're a thespian, dog. Half the room said, I don't even know what that is, bro. <laughs> it's an actor. Like, we, 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 have, we, have an, we have this idea. Like, I, I played sports. I, I, love, I love it. Like, I, I wanted to do it. I mean, who don't grow up going, one day I'm going to play for the Dallas Cowboys. 
Like, I mean, we all got that plan, right? I, I know, I, I get it, but, but, but the truth of the matter is, is, is we laugh at the WWE because it's fake, and then we watch other stuff, and we oh, that's fake. And then we watch the other sports, and we're like, well, this is real. And, like, at the end of the day, none of it, like, it, it, like all of the sports are as silly as the WWE. And I know there's that one, like, the Rock Johnson fan in the room right now that's like, WWE is not fake. I know, I feel you. Like you're in there. Hulk Hogan was my hero and you can shut your mouth, Satan. I'm with you. I liked him too. All right? I'm more of a macho man Randy Savage type guy. Was, I mean, it was just, it's ridiculous, right? But we, we fill our lives with these things because we don't want to deal with life. I'm not speaking from a place of judgment. I'm, I'm speaking from a place of experience. Like we, we fill our lives with things that really do not matter. And then we wonder why when real things happen, we can't handle them. Because we filled up the space and the capacity, our capacity with things that don't matter, when things come along that do matter, we don't have room for it. And so then we have an overflow of bad emotions and anxiety. Think about that for a minute. And I was thinking about anxiety uh, and get ready for this. And my wife and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through a couple of times. I think many of us in this room have had it. Like, I didn't know what it was. But when I was 19 years old, I can remember the first time I had a really, a really, and I look back now and say, oh, wow, that was, you had a panic attack. It was bad. And back then I was just like, what the heck is wrong with you, dude? Suck it up. But I couldn't. I was a 280-pound guy. I was a football player at that time. I'm supposed to be too tough for this stuff, right? And I found myself curled up on the floor, fetal position, freezing cold, shivering, almost passed out, had no idea what was happening. There's someone, you've been there before. It, it, was, it was rough. Coming forward in time, like I... I know that there was a time I pulled into, I pulled into the driveway and I was on the phone with my wife. Something had just happened. And she said, hey, the girls are coming out. I said, please keep them in the house. She said, why? I said, I think I'm, I don't know why, but like, I can't breathe right now. And I just need to be alone for a second. It was the last thing I really needed. Why? Because I'm going to deal with my emotions myself. And I thought, well, I'll just do breathing techniques to get through this. And really, what was going on, my body was telling me, whatever you're doing right now, you're unhealthy, bro, because you got so much junk in your life that's unhealthy for you, and you're feeling yourself, you're eating bad food. We eat a bunch of food full of, of seed oils and everything else, junk that's just, just wrecking us. I know there's a crunchy mom in the room like right now, like, oh, he said something about seed oils, yay. <laughs> that would be my wife if she was here right now. And you need to take your shoes off and do some grounding outside in the grass. <laughs> 30 minutes a day. It's like it gets your energy fields properly aligned, you know? I know who you people are. <laughs> I married one, and she's right half the time. <laughs> And like instead, though, no, 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 I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. And I remember, though, even back further, like a tant time, and this is, this is where, I, and this is back when, some of you heard me tell this story, um, I was, I didn't want to be a preacher. Um, I did it, I, I went with it, I was like, okay, God, I'll give you a chance. Isn't that funny how that works? <laughs> God, he's like, sure, idiot. Anyways. <laughs> but he didn't talk to me like that, because he doesn't want me to talk to myself that way. But anyways. But I'll never forget, like, I had so much anxiety, something had happened in our church, and we were going through a lot of things, and I was a youth pastor at the time, and up to this point, like, I thought, like, eventually in life, I'm going to move on to something else, and I sit in this, dry, in this, in this parking lot right here, and I stared at this church, and I said, God, don't take this away from me. It's the best thing you've ever done for me. And I remember all that anxiety, it actually drove me to a right place where I hit my knees and I said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. All I know is that I finally found where I belong and I'm doing what you've called me to do and I'm sorry I ever, I ever didn't want to do it because right now I want it more than ever. 
And God, you can't take this. God, please, right? I care. I care about people. I care about kids and youth group. I care about people in this church. God, you, you, you've got to, you got to work, you, you got to work it out. And, and, and once you know it, God works things out. Like when we think it's all falling apart, God's like, it's cool, I got it. And then it come out and it was okay. It was, our, it was it's an ama- and it's amazing how that sometimes we'll find ourselves in our best times being our worst selves. And it's because we've done it to ourselves. It reminds me, I've preached a lot about this subject over the years. Man, I have preached this subject. Man, I have preached this subject, especially in youth, like it was like fire, calling fire down from heaven. Yes! Fire from heaven! By the way, last week I forgot the name of a band. Living Sacrifice, thank you very much. My man, coming through for me. Living sacrifice, men in the room, if you want to have some good positive <laughs> death metal in your life. <laughs> those are two words that don't go together, death and positive. <laughs> it is Christian based. I really, I don't like to call it death metal. They put in that. I call it apocalypse metal. Amen. <laughs> apocalypse metal. But anyways, when, when I was a youth pastor, like I had, that, I had that, that tenacity and that like, really I was just young and dumb, right? I'm still young. Still dumb, but working on it. But anyways, so um, I, I, just, I really, like, I, man, I, I would preach this message, and, and man, call it, God wants to use you to defeat 850 prophets of Baal, and the kids are like, yes. And that's great, but there's so much more to talk about when it comes to Elijah. And today, I kind of want to do, I kind of want to walk through 1 Kings 19, and, and kind of go through some of these things because there's a lot to learn about it. See, it, when you know a little bit about Elijah, you know that in 1 Kings 18, he defeats 850 prophets of Baal. I mean, he single-handedly, well, excuse me, God defeated, ooh, <laughs> boom. God defeated 850 prophets of Baal. He was used in the process. He ends up interceding to God on behalf of the people, on behalf of Israel. And he prays a prayer that ends a three and a half year drought. He's on top of the world. Like I I literally, in where he defeated the prophets of Baal, I was there in Haifa, Israel this past year and I, I got to see that high place. We actually at one point went to Ahab's palace uh, in, in one passage where there's a Roman corridor, there's, it's a pretty neat place, very ancient area. And there's still some of the temples where Jezebel did some of her sacrifices. And I'm, I'm guessing, wildly enough, probably were some child, I told my wife that. I said, you realize there were probably like child sacrifices right here? You want to talk about a dark place. When that hit me, I just thought, my God. And, and people would say, can you imagine living in a world where there's child sacrifices? Yeah, we live in one. We abort our, child, our children in the name of humanism and whatever feels good, do it. And, like, and so like, I, I think back to this story, I think, man, he's on top of the world. But then something happens in 1 Kings chapter 19. It says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. You ever been there before? Like you did something and somebody went told on you, right? So Ahab, he goes and he tells how, how he executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger, messenger to Elijah saying, and it's interesting, he sent a messenger. It makes me think of Facebook messenger. Anybody here ever got ugly comments in Facebook messenger? Oh, y'all aren't living enough if you haven't been talked crazy to in Facebook messenger. <laughs> Oh, man, I've gotten some messages. I've been told that, that I was the worst preacher. I was the worst. Hey, you, hey, guys, let me tell you something. I've learned a lesson. Sh- shut off the people, the naysayers in your life. And I'm not talking about people who are challenging you. There's nothing wrong with being challenged. But when all somebody wants to do is run you down, whew, we're done, right? Why? Because God said different. If God said it, then I'm going to stand on it. If God called me, then I'm going to do what he called me to do. 
It's also why I don't listen to just tons of preachers. A lot of people say, Chris, why do you, you know, do you listen to this? Or do you listen? I, I do listen to some preachers. I, I really do. But, but let me tell you something, guys. Do you know how many people try to speak into my life? Somebody has always got a word for a preacher. If I listen to every word that's been given to me and, like, and, and I will take it, something, and let me tell you, I always tell people, when they tell me, hey, it's uplifting, it's edifying, I receive it. Amen? Yes. And I do. There's been people in this room, you've given me a word at very key points, and you don't realize it, but you spoke. I needed that, that edification. But when somebody comes to you and tells you, all the negative in the world, God showed me to tell you, da, 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 and you need to go this direction with this church, and you need to go that direction. Well, by God, we'd be going a hundred different directions as a church. And so sometimes, like, that's what happens here. She sends a messenger to Elijah, and she says, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of the one, uh, of one of them by tomorrow, one of the prophets he had killed about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and he ran for his. He's on top of the world. God has just proven how powerful he is. He's just defeated 850 prophets of Baal. And right now, she, a woman comes to him and tells him, I'm going I'm to have your head. And he runs from a woman. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Women, that tells you something. The person we fear most in this world is mama when we get home. <laughs> but it's interesting here. He's running from her. He's afraid and he runs for his life. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and, and came and sat under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. Went from being on top of the world in an instance to God, just let me die. He said, it is, it is enough now, he says, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Well, where did that even come from? I'm no better than my father's. Like, where did that even, if you notice right here, he's beginning to talk to, he's beginning, his self-talk's getting a little bit sideways. He starts bringing up things that are irrelevant. This is, this is an interesting passage because we look at Elijah and we, we see all the greatness. But I want you to just think for a minute, how many times do you go through something and you start telling yourself that are, or the self things that are irrelevant to the situation you're in? We do. Like, like we, we, we'll, something will happen, somebody will give us a funny look. This happens to me all the time. I, I don't, I, I'm convinced, I'm, I'm nine times out of ten convinced nobody likes me. Anybody ever been there before? Like, like man, I, 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 I don't think that guy likes me. Come to find out, homeboy had a bellyache. Right? Like, and, and that's what had some stomach issues, and, and that stink eye he gave you was not because he don't like you, it's because he was looking for the nearest restroom. <laughs> and then you'll start convincing yourself, it's probably what I had on today. Right? Has nothing to do. It's not about you, bro. And here Elijah is, and he's in this moment. God has used him to prove his majesty to every to, to, to all of Israel and how powerful he is. And Elijah is focused in on man, she wants to kill me now. And here he is, and he keeps going in verse five. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him. And this is, this is really God coming through an angel is what this is in this passage of Scripture. Angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. In other words, hey, Elijah, you're all down on yourself right now. Brother, you need to eat something. See, that's what a lot of us, we're going through things. We got all these things going on. And we just keep pushing it. We keep pushing it. We keep pushing it. And the fact of the matter is, you just need, some, you need to stop for a minute and get some nourishment. That's right. That pint of cookies and cream bluebell I ate last night was for my mental health. <laughs> right? Get over it. Jamie. <laughs> ah, who am I kidding? She settled in right beside me and ate some herself. But anyways. <laughs> the truth is, is he needed some nourishment. God knew this. He said, bro, you're having a bad day. You're hangry. Here's the Snickers. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake based on coals and a 
jar, a jar of water. God, I mean, God's literally setting it up for him. He knows, but you, you need some help here. So he ate and he drank. He lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back second time, touched him again and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. See, a lot of us, we, we look at situations in our life. We say, it's too great for me. And God's saying, yeah, I know it's too great for you because it's something I called you to and you can't do it without me. He says, so the journey, it's too great for you, man. So he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And see, the truth of the matter is, is that many of us, like we're, we're not meant for the lives that we live and we, we, we push it too hard and we're pushing. We're trying to do God things. We're trying to do things that are beyond our ability on our own accord. I've talked about this a whole lot over the past. I, I feel like this year, this is a message that we, I'm really trying to get our church, get a hold of this, man. You, look, you and I need Jesus involved in everything we're doing. Everything. Well, just church stuff. Everything. Everything. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care if you're cleaning toilets for a living. Have Jesus involved in it. God, just like you made this, I'm making this toilet clean right now. Make me clean just like it in Jesus' name. I know I put, <laughs> I don't know, I know God, I put a lot of crap in my life. But <laughs> okay, hey, scratch that off the recording. Anyways. <laughs> I know, God, I know I've done a lot of things wrong, but God, God, clean me. Whatever it takes, put him at the center of everything that you're doing. See, the truth of the matter is, Stephen Lardy in the book, The Depression Cure, said this. He says, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. Well, Chris, you said sedentary. Yeah, that's the funny part. We're sedentary, yet we live a life of frenzy and a hurried pace. It don't make no sense, does it? But we do. Like if you start thinking about life and some of the things that you have done in your life and the things that have brought you turmoil and heart, heartache and it's really just affected you in such a negative way, think about how much of it is brought on by just how, how much junk am I filling my life with? One of my things is, is we, I believe in spending time with family and doing family things. But the fact of the matter is, is that my kids, we play soccer. They love soccer. And I've had, I've had coaches try to get them into everything else. And I'm like, let me tell you something. Coach, you ain't going to rule my life. God is the ruler of my life. That was, that was, I don't know, man. I don't know if that went over very well. <laughs> it's true. I'm a grown man. I ain't going to have a grown man setting a schedule for my life based upon a sport. Think about it for a minute. Like real talk. Like that, that, that's something that, that, that's something that it's one of the biggest issues as I'm talking to parents right now that is going on. There's so many parents talking to me about it. Man, I, this, this stuff's going, hey, maybe you need to look at them and say no. Well, your kid is off the team. Oh, no! This is, this is very unpopular, I know. And you're probably wondering, why does this even matter right now? Because there's so many people sitting in this room right now. We are letting other things that do not matter control, and it's leading us around like a hook in our nose. And we're wondering, like, we're wondering, why am I so stressed out? Well, look at your schedule. All right, I might get fired after this week. Anyways... And this is where, now hang on a second, this is where we come to our first point of the day. And there's five major points I'm going to give you. And this is from the book, Out of the Cave by Chris Hodges. Don't miss your opportunity. Get, go, go to Mardell, buy that book if you can, if you've got some things going on in your life. But the first thing he says we need to do is we need to find the, what he calls the pace of grace. Pace of grace. How graceful is my pace of life? Ecclesiastes 4 and 6 says, better... A handful with quietness than both hands full together with toll and grasping for the wind. In other words, he's saying it's better to have one handful. You know, we're, we're, we're Americans. We have a tendency to, like, if I can have one handful, then what else do I want? 
Another handful. And then I can't hold. Ooh, see what happens? I have no more capacity to handle anything else that comes my way. Think about it for a minute. Right? This is, this is, a, big, this is a big issue. I swear, a lot of this stuff, though, I'm talking about, I've learned from my wife, and I wish she could step up and talk about some of this stuff, because it, it, it's so good. Like, I have so many things going on in my life that I can't keep up with life itself. Like, if, if, I got, if I got one truck, what's better than one truck? Two trucks. Right? I got one nice hunting rifle. What's better than one rifle? I've got one. Somebody said like six. I mean, you can't have enough, you know. Come on. I'm with you. I feel you. I got one wife. What's better than one? No, anyway. <laughs> it's true, though. That's how some people act, isn't it? I want all of them. You can't handle all of them. And so I've got to find a pace that actually fits. And so this is where we find ourselves in 1 Kings 19, 9 through 12. It says, and there he went into a cave. This is, this is where the book kind of came from, the Chris Hodges wrote. And spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so here he goes. He said, I have been a very zealous. I've been very zealous. And then he goes even further. For the Lord, God of hosts, it's kind of like he's saying it's your fault. Don't we do that? God, I got all these things going on in my life. I'm trying to do things right. And you, he goes on. He says, he keeps going. He says, so I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. He says, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. He said, I alone am left and they seek to take my life. He, he, first of all, this isn't true. Y'all see how he's ruminating? He's beginning. I'm going to explain that in just a second. He just keeps using this, this same. He just keeps telling himself self things that are not true. Like, I'm the only one left living for God. You ever been there before? Right? I'm the only one in this house who even cares what God thinks anymore, evidently. Well, your kids too. Like, they don't even understand the concept yet. Like, <laughs> no, real talk. Like, here he is, and he, he, he doesn't even realize, like, there's other people out there but he's convinced himself I'm all by myself poor me my dad calls that a thumb sucking mentality then he said go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by the great strong God spoke this to him with a strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, here's where it happens. A still, small voice. I wonder how many times God's trying to speak to us on something, trying to speak something into us, but we're running our mouth and our mind way too loud for Him to even speak. He's trying to talk to us, and we're going, yeah, but God. And he's sitting there going, dude, dude, come on, man. Do you know who I am? Like, you ever, you, ever, you, ever, you ever been in a point of life before, and you were in an argument with your parents, and you said something, and they backed up and went, who do you think you're talking to? Like, I wonder how many times I've been talking, and you say, yeah, but God, did you bring you <laughs> and he's like sitting there like who do you think you're talking to dude where were you like he talked to Job where were you when I created everything didn't like I'm watching I turn on the news and I see things happen in the news and, and it's like God's like yeah did you read the Bible I said this is going to happen what are you worried about I told you but what did I tell you I, I'll take care of you 
I told you, you were going to face things in life. You're going to face struggles. You were going to be cheated, mistreated, talked bad about, walked on. I mean, you were going to be done sorry. He told us in the scripture, and he says, but listen, I'll always be with you. I'm going to walk you through every single bit of it. Where were you at when I literally, I didn't even have to move my hands to make everything that is. I just spoke. But when I made you, I did use my hands and I formed you because you're that important to me. Think about that for just a second. And so in that still, small voice, he speaks. And this brings us to point number two. I have to cultivate the presence of God in my life. I know this sounds like a broken record, but... Well, I've heard you say that before. How are you doing with it? I have to cultivate the presence of God in my life. Life, because when I call to, and, and like, I can't depend on, well, I went to church on Sunday and you didn't speak to my need. There's 300 other people in the room. Right? I, we we, we got to preach this. Like, you need a personal relationship with God where God can speak to your direct situations at any given time. Come on. Like, you need that. Psalm, 30, Psalm 73 says this, is when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me key point right here y'all ready next word until see a lot of us we have painful situations in our life and we're facing some things we're having we're having struggles to it and it's going to stay that way until we go into the sanctuary of God then we will understand the end to these things and there are so many things and I'll so what do I do it's a very simple concept. We've talked about this, preached about this for, year, for years, and it's the first 15. Look at your neighbor, nudge him, say the first 15. When you wake up in the morning, don't grab your phone, turn off your alarm, realize you have an extra five minutes, and then go to social media. It's the worst thing. And I'm going to admit something. Yesterday morning, I rolled over, and my phone dinged about the same time and I saw the headline of what was going on in another country. And what did it do? Oh, God. And see, so often we let, and what, what it is, like, here's another way to put it, we're letting the crowd control what we, how we view the world. We're letting everything outside of us, and that stress is what that is. And then we get in our own mind and we start talking, and now we get ourselves into a place, and something I hadn't talked about yet, depression, where I'm in this cave, just like Elijah is in this moment. I'm complaining about everything, but how do I get out of it? The, the second, cultivate that presence of God in my life, the first 15, what does that look like? Five minutes in the Word every morning. Well, pastor, that's not enough. Listen, it sure beats the nothing you're doing. I'm not throwing rocks at you. I be that guy sometimes. <laughs> Five minutes in the Word. Five minutes of worship. Guess how long the average worship song is? About five minutes. Unless you're listening to prophetic worship, then it's going to be an hour long, one song. I mean, it's like an ongoing... <laughs> But no, 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 seriously, five minutes, I mean, the average worship song, just listen to one worship song, sit in the presence of God, magnify his name for a moment, and then spend five minutes just talking to him for just a minute. Come on, man, this will change, I believe that if you will take the first 15 minutes of your day and do this, it will change your life. Does anybody believe that in the room? I believe it will change your life. Five minutes of word, five minutes of worship, five minutes of prayer. Notice what the last thing was there. I talk last. Now do it in that order. Word, worship, prayer. Why? Word, God, I'm going to read your word. Then I'm going to worship you. And probably by the time I open my mouth to start talking, some of the things I was thinking, I started reading the word. I ain't worried about it anymore. Why? Because I just elevated Jesus to his rightful place in my life. He is in control of everything and I don't have to worry. Come on. Y'all believe that? 1 Kings 19, 13 through 14 says, So it was when Elijah heard it and he wrapped his face in his mantle. Man, 
What is mantle? It's another cloak. He wraps his face in his cloak. He went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He's whispering to him, what are you doing here? And he said, I have been very zealous. It's the second time. He didn't learn the first time. This is the second. I've been very zealous, and I did it for you, God. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, they torn down your altars, and they've killed your prophets with a sword. And all by myself. Is that Tammy Tucker? I can't remember. I'm the only one. And it's not even true. Elijah, what are you doing? Hey, Chris, you're not alone. And what, what he did, what's interesting is he feels alone right now huh? because he made himself alone. He ran from everybody. And of course, because of that action, he feels alone. They seek to take my life. And this is rumination. And what is rumination? I've used this word a couple times this morning. Rumination is the focused attention on the symptoms of one's distress. Not even what's real. It's the symptoms of one's distress as opposed to its solutions. And what we do is we ruminate. We, oh, I'm feeling symptoms. Like, literally, it, it, man, something's going on. Something's going on. I have something going on with my stomach. No, bro, you ate bad beans. I, I don't know what's happening in my life right now. Everything is sideways. Probably because you ate a half gallon of ice cream, Chris. I'm just fatigued all the time. Because our, our dopamine levels are jacked up, right? My adrenal glands busted up because I drink 800 milligrams of coffee, uh, milligrams of caffeine every morning just to get going. Got quiet in here. What, y'all don't do that? <laughs> no, seriously. Like, a lot of, like, I, I was talking to somebody just here recently. We were talking about how much, how many, like, we know exactly how many milligrams of caffeine it takes to get going in the mornings, right? We know exactly how many, like, if I get this amount, I'll be good to go. I, I, I'm not going to lie. Even before I come preach on a Sunday morning, they used to have me on Adderall. That, that stimulant is of the devil. Caffeine, though, that's of God. That's completely okay. We even serve it. We even serve it. We, we serve it in the, in the hallways. You can get coffee. We're all about that caffeine. Praise God. And wonder why I crashed about 3 o'clock this, this afternoon, about 3 o'clock, and guarantee you, I'm going to be like, I'm done. It's nap time, right? Dad, you're going to have to do the driving. All right? <laughs> Just one, one, of, one of those, if we just started removing these things, what would happen? So then we get all these symptoms and we have all this stuff built up. And I'm almost done this morning. And we start, our self-talk gets sideways. And we go to things like Psalm 23. I heard somebody read the anti-Psalm, but I said, no, like, I just want to read Psalm 23 again to you. I read it this summer in a message. I'm, I'm going to read it again to you. But I'm going to show you what we actually do. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, but dad gummit, all I do is want. I want more. This doesn't apply to me because, well, I, I, I'm in need, God. I, I need more things. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. <laughs> but I live in central Texas. We've been in a drought all summer. There's no <laughs> green pastures here. He leads me beside the still waters. <laughs> Have you seen the Brazos River? It's filthy. I'm not getting in there. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His sake. And he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. <laughs> Forget that. I'm going to fear every single day of my life. This is how we act, you see? And he goes on, he says, For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <laughs> More like beats me all the time. I mean, this literally, it's, it's, it's how we act, right? You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, but I don't like the food you put on it. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. 
What do we say to that? I, yeah, I, it's running over with junk I can't handle. It's all we focus on. We just, we just focus on it and we ruminate over and over and over. And then when he says, surely goodness shall, and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. No, we say, surely struggle and turmoil and, and, and just all the problems of the world shall follow me. And then we get it to the end. It says, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But, but no, I don't feel like I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'm, I'm reading this to you this morning because I'm, I'm trying to get through to you for just a minute. To, that we read these and then we walk away from them and we tell ourselves something totally different. Stop doing that. When you read that passage, the Lord, He is my shepherd. He, like, I don't want for anything. He takes care of me. Sometimes the devil will have me convinced or myself will have me convinced that I don't have enough. But God's looking, looking at you going, you have plenty And the fact of the matter is, Brian Tracy says this, 95% of our emotions are determined by the way we talk to ourselves. The way we talk to ourselves. This brings to the third thing, the narrative I believe about myself come. I have to let the narrative that I believe about myself come from God's word. Not the word of my emotions or the word of others who will lead me away from the narrative that God has given for me. 1 Kings 19.15 says, Then the Lord said to him, So here he is, he's complained, he's done all these different things, and the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of, to, to, uh, to the wilderness of Damascus. Arrive, anoint Hazael, the king of Syria. He says, Also anoint Jehu, the king over Israel. And he says, Anoint the Eli- Elisha, the son of Sh- Shaphat, of Abel. You shall anoint his prophet in your place. Now, now, I think this is interesting right here. I was trying to find this passage. I was reading through it because I'm trying to speed up. But listen to me for a second. Not only does God speak to him and give him direction, he's telling him, like, you're so not alone that I want you to go anoint two kings, and then I want you to go anoint the guy that's going to take your place. And it's going to have much more, it's going to walk in even more anointing that you've walked in. You think you're alone? You think you're, you're not alone? And I want to say to you in this room today, and I don't, I'm not being mean when I say it, I, I, I'm trying to, I want to encourage you this morning, you are not alone. And no matter what you tell yourself, you're not the only person that has dealt with some of the situations that you're dealing with right now. And so he goes on, he says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. There's 7,000 people in Israel. 7,000. All whose knees have not bowed to Baal in every mouth that has not kissed him. He has, not, he has not given himself. These are 7,000 people who have not given themselves to Baal, but they still worship me, and you didn't even know about them. Don't talk about something you don't know, Elijah. Quit telling yourself, yourself things when you only have a small percentage of the, the whole picture. This brings to the fourth thing. Find. Some of you need to find your God-given purpose. Some of us, though, need to renew our God-given purpose. We always talk about finding it, but what about renewing it? Here's a real question for the room real quick. How many people have in here have ever stopped doing something that God told you to do? You've stopped doing something God put on your heart. Here's the flip side. Or you've kept doing something that God, at some point, moved on you to stop doing. I've found that that happens many times. God will convict me about something and I'll stop doing it. And if you're not careful, you'll start slipping back into these things. And, and, if, and, and what will end up happening is you'll wonder, why is, why is everything sideways? Because God spoke. He spoke. God, give me a word. He gives you a word. Yeah, not that word. <laughs> Somebody posted this week, a, a local a fr- a friend of mine posted this week about a pastor. Like, if, if, you, if your pastor can't say something to correct something in your life, and you're like, no, that's not for me. Like, like and he goes down the whole list, and he gets to the end, he says, he says if, if, they can't, if they can't speak to it, and you'll move every time he says something that you don't like, then what ends up happening is, you're not looking for a covering, you're looking for a cover up. Oh, that was good. Oh, that was good. I think you shared that too. Um, all my, I have tons of pastor friends that shared that this week. I was like, Boy, boy, they speaking this way. They trying to talk to somebody, amen? <laughs> it's true. It's true. I don't like the way he said that. 
I think the world has had enough of we don't like the way people tweet. You just let that fall however you want. But anyways, <laughs> happy now? <laughs> but it, I mean, I mean it's, it's a real question. What, what have I done? And this, this is where we have to set some boundaries and some direction or simpler, more simply set some do's and don'ts. See, God's trying to get you to do some. There's some things you need to just say no to. I don't have time for that. Come to my, my kid's birthday party. I, and I don't mean this toward anybody in the room it, 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 at, at all. But if, if like, like, think about it. If you try to make every birthday party of every kid that you have, why is he preaching against birthday parties? I'm not. <laughs> but, like, seriously, if I try to make everything to make everybody else happy, I'll drive myself crazy. And this, in turn, quit putting expectations on people that they can't meet. Do unto others you'd have them do unto... Oh, it's an amazing thing. It applies more than just judging people. And so I need to set some do's and don'ts to keep myself healthy in the proper pursuit of God's mission in my life. And this is back to what, what Chris Hodges calls that first point, the pace of grace. I've got to be serious about it. Rick Warren said this, without God, life has no purpose. As our musicians come back, without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, life has no significance or hope. And this is where we find ourselves riddled with anxiety, dealing with depression, unable to climb out of the caves that we've put ourselves in because we're unwilling to step in the right direction of purpose. An unknown author online, I found this last night. So you are God's masterpiece. As long as you answer to His purpose for you with faith and in prayer, He can never fail you. 1 Kings 19, 19-20. So He departed from there. He left the cave. And He found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, Bowing with twelve yoke oxen before him. And he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle or his cloak on him. He threw it on him. I mean, imagine some prophet walks by and he throws his mantle on you, throws his cloak on you. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm all alone, God. Nobody wants to serve you. I want you to anoint him to replace you. See, this is where we also do some, something else. We think God doesn't have other people in his hands and he's not using them. We think I'm the only one. And then we get into, well, they don't do things the way I think they should do it. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it as good as I do it. And then again, God says, who are you? We let's see what we build these, but God, I don't know. But God, God will speak to us. But yeah, but God, I don't know. I don't know if Elisha, I don't know. He's out there, he's farming. I don't know if he's ready to be a prophet. He says, no, I want you to anoint him. And Elisha does something right here. If you, you, gotta, <laughs> you need to go and study the story between Elisha and Elijah. Oh, Elisha, he... He wouldn't get away from Elijah. He knew that's a man of God. I'm staying with him. A couple times Elijah even told him, hey, you can stop here. Elisha said, nope. I ain't stopping here. Why? I'm coming with you. Why? Because, because you're the man of God. God speaks to you. I'm coming with you. I wonder how often Elijah was like, dude, will you just give me, like, get, cut me some slack for a minute, bro? I just want to go over here and by myself for like two minutes, bro. Nope. <laughs> I got a daughter like that. Hey, baby, can you let dad just have a minute? Yeah, dad. I, you going to let me have it? You're not going anywhere, are you? Nope. I'll just be quiet, though, dad. Okay. 
I, this passage really got me because I know this relationship between my dad and I. When you know someone's anointed, and you know something, and you're saying, hey, stay there. Stay, stick with him. There's a, there's a bond there. there it's why I'm, I'm getting to something. Hang with me. There's a bond there. Be, you're not, he's not perfect. I've seen, I've seen his backside enough times, and guess what? He's seen mine enough times. For the first year of my life, he saw it all the time. But anyways... And so he said, please. He comes to me. He said, wait, 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 wait. Don't leave. You anointed me. That's great. But hold on. Let me go kiss my mom and dad goodbye. Because your anointing, that was great. But see, no, nah, man, I ain't staying here. I'm coming with you. And so then, now, all of a sudden, Elijah is no longer alone. He all of a sudden has this guy behind him that's walking with him. It's as if God's saying, you see that? Not only were you not alone, I'm going to give you somebody to put your, pour yourself into because he's going to come behind you. He's going to stand on your shoulders because you are strong enough to let him stand on your shoulders. And he's going to do great things for me. So this morning, hey, Come out of the cave. Some of you, have, you've been dealing with things in your mind. You can't get over these negative thoughts. You're, there's somebody in the room right now. You're struggling with some things. And I've taken some time this morning. But, but listen to me. You're struggling with some things. And God, I believe God's trying to tell you this morning. Hey, hey, get up. Dust yourself off. Go get you. Maybe you need to dust yourself off and then lay right back down on the couch and have some rest for a minute. Quit pushing so hard after things that don't matter. Why don't you start focusing on things that do matter, like Jesus? And, fifth point, I need to maintain my life with godly relationships. Start focusing on the people in your life that love you and want to pour into you. Ecclesiastes 4, 9-10 through 10 says two are better than one. Because they have good reward on their labor. I thought you said one handful, not two handfuls. Well, this is a different context. Two are better than one, talking about people. Because they have good reward on their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Verse 12 says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And threefold cord is not easily broken. As you stand all over the room this morning. I want to encourage you today. I know we've taken a minute here. I want to encourage you for just a minute. I want you to say these things with me. Because here's how we're going to end. And if you want these, we'll, we'll post them up somewhere. Or I can send you notes, however you want to do it. There's a couple of biblical concepts I want us to end with this morning. And I wonder if we can just quote it all together. And as our, as our leaders come down to the altar space, we even have, we've tried something new now. We have a couple of prayer people. For those of you guys in the balcony, y'all have an altar space now. It's right there in the middle. Right there. Tony, wave at him right there. That's that guy. You have your own altar space, so you don't have to go all the way down and around and go through the process. If you need prayer, it's right there. But listen to me for just a second. Say this with me this morning. God wants me to get my anxiety. God is with me. God is fighting for me. Anxiety doesn't get to win. God is greater than my anxiety. No matter what this world says, there will be peace in my life. And this is the big one we got to get a hold of. No matter what it looks like right now, 
no matter what you're feeling, no matter what the news stations are saying, there will be victory. Do you believe that this morning? Can we end that in a hand clap of praise? Let's all lift our hands to heaven following that in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for your truth that leads us and guides us. Thank you for being a God that moves in our situations. We're asking you today, come on, if one of you here, you want to repent today and you want to start your walk with God, go ahead and lift a hand up even higher right now in the name of Jesus. God, today, God, we turn away from our feelings. We turn against the lies of the of the world and we turn to you and we say, God, let it be your will, not my will, but God, lead me. God, you are my salvation, God. You are the victory in my life over everything that I'm facing. And today, God, I give my life to you. I give my situations to you. Come now, Lord, and do your will in my life. In Jesus' name.